Hello everybody. Today we're going to be discussing Peter Carruthers' uh, defense of the moral permissibility of animal use. In 1992, the philosopher Peter Carruthers published a very influential book entitled The Animal's Issue, Moral Theory and Practice. In that book, he defended the moral permissibility of using animals for food and factory farming, animal experimentation, and a variety of other practices where animals are used. He argued for the moral permissibility of these practices based on the moral theory of contractualism. Before explaining the moral theory of contractualism, however, we must first understand Carruthers' meta-ethics. The first component of Carruthers' view is his meta-ethics. To understand this topic, it will help to compare and contrast it with other areas of moral philosophy. There is, first, applied ethics, which addresses specific or practical moral issues such as abortion, animal rights, and euthanasia. In this area, philosophers debate whether these practices are morally permissible or morally wrong. Secondly, there is normative ethics, which is where philosophers put forth moral theories or explanations of what the nature of right action is. On some moral theories, for instance, a philosopher will claim that the nature of right action is grounded in its consequences or is treating individuals as ends in themselves. Finally, there is meta-ethics, which is concerned with the nature of morality itself. In meta-ethics, philosophers ask questions such as, what are we doing when we make a moral judgment? Are we just expressing our emotions, or are we saying something that could be true or false? In other words, what are we doing when we talk moral talk? An analogy put forth by Andrew Fisher in his book, Meta-Ethics, an Introduction, helps clarify these areas of moral philosophy. Consider the practice of applied ethics, normative ethics, and meta-ethics like a game of football. The applied ethicists can be thought of as the players, since they are concerned with directly addressing the moral permissibility or moral wrongness of specific moral issues. For instance, the applied ethicists want to know if abortion is morally wrong, and if so, why. The normative ethicist can be thought of like the referee, because he is the one that establishes the rules or principles that govern the applied ethicist. He will point out, for example, that if abortion is wrong, what moral principle or rule explains this moral judgment? Finally, there are the meta-ethicists, who can be thought of as the commentators or pundits of the game. They are concerned with what is going on when we make moral judgments. Like the football commentators, they talk about the nature of the game itself rather than interpret the rules like the referee or participate like the players. Why does this meta-ethics stuff matter to Carruthers' view about our moral obligations toward animals? It matters, according to Carruthers, because we want to know whether any of our moral judgments are true. Many philosophers, such as A.J. Eyre, have argued that moral judgments are simply expressions of emotion. Under this view, if I claim cruelty to animals is wrong, we should understand this judgment as akin to saying, boo, cruelty to animals. This view is known as emotivism. If emotivism is true, then it will undermine the possibility of justifying any of our moral judgments, because no one debating a moral issue could offer reasons for why their moral judgment is correct. If I like classical music and you dislike it, for instance, it would clearly be strange for me to say, no, you are committing a mistake in reasoning by failing to like classical music. If moral judgments are simply expressions of emotion, similar to musical preferences, and, for this reason, there are no correct answers to moral questions, then it would clearly be a waste of time for Carruthers to even write a book arguing for the moral permissibility of using animals to serve human ends. Carruthers, however, is not convinced of the claims made by the emotivist. The reason is that we experience morality like it is a realm of facts rather than a matter of taste. For example, if someone believes that killing chickens and cows for food is morally permissible, but thinks killing dogs and cats for food is wrong, people feel pressure to explain why these two beliefs are not inconsistent or contradictory with one another. With matters of taste, by contrast, we do not have this same motivation to resolve inconsistencies. For example, if I tell you that I love Chopin's music, but dislike the music of Mozart, I do not feel pressured to justify or explain why I prefer one over the other, even though they are both pianists. Given that we experience morality as a realm of facts rather than a matter of taste, it follows that emotivism is false.
One contrasting view to emotivism is strong moral objectivism, or intuitionism. First developed by G.E. Moore, intuitionism is the thesis that moral values exist out there in the fabric of the cosmos and that we come to have justified beliefs about moral facts through our intuitions. Champions of intuitionism claim that moral values exist in a realm of their own, which is independent of the physical world. On this view, moral values can be thought of as existing like God, numbers, abstract objects, or other immaterial entities. Why should we accept intuitionism? One factor which motivates intuitionism, according to Carruthers, is that it can account for a great deal of common sense morality. The intuitionist can maintain, for instance, that we can know that torturing babies for fun is morally wrong simply by reflecting on or being exp exposed to the case in question. Pain is intuitively bad in itself, he will say, and we do not need any further explanation to justify our knowledge of this moral judgment. Despite the fact that Carruthers rejects emotivism, he also thinks that intuitionism is untenable. Drawing on arguments first made by John Mackey in his book, Ethics, Inventing Right and Wrong, Carruthers puts forth Mackey's argument from queerness, which is a metaphysical or ontological objection to the intuitionist's claim that moral values exist out there in the fabric of the cosmos. Specifically, Mackey maintains that, quote, if there were objective moral values, then they would be entities or qualities or relations of a very strange sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe, end quote. In short, moral values are queer, Mackey gives three reasons for why moral values are like this. One is that, first, the truth of a moral value is not dependent upon the attitudes of observers. In other words, moral values are independent of our beliefs. Consider, for instance, the moral judgment, torturing babies for fun is wrong. We do not believe that this would suddenly become right if enough people believed it was. We say things such as, despite what people think, torturing babies for fun is wrong. Secondly, given that moral values do not exist in the natural world, how are they supposed to interact with something within the natural world? More specifically, how can we have moral knowledge at all if moral values are immaterial? As Carruthers points out, how is the property of being valuable supposed to give rise to beliefs in us about it? Finally, moral values give us reasons to act independently of our desires. For instance, if eating animals is wrong, then that is a reason not to do it. But, as Andrew Fisher points out, where does the reason-giving feature of moral values reside? Mackey thinks it must be part of the value itself. He explains, quote, An objective would be sought by anyone who was acquainted with it, not because of any contingent fact that this person, or every person, is so constituted that he desire this end, but just because the end has to be pursued and is somehow built into it, end quote. But this just seems bizarre. How can something in the world have don't murder built into it? Since the existence of moral values residing in the cosmos would have all these queer or objectionable features, this counts against the plausibility of beliefs in their existence. Given Carruthers' rejection of both emotivism and intuitionism, what other meta-ethical alternatives are available for him? He maintains that weak objectivism is the only acceptable meta-ethical alternative account. On this view, moral judgments are neither simply expressions of emotion nor recognition of moral facts that exist out there in the fabric of the cosmos. Rather, they are human constructions used for the purpose of making civilized life possible. The fact that they are human constructions, however, does not mean it is impossible for there to be moral truths. Consider traffic laws to illustrate this point. The claim that green means go is objectively true in the human realm relative to standards that society has agreed to. However, it is not objectively true in the absence of rational agents that set up those standards. Weak objectivism, therefore, does not suffer from the difficulties that accompany intuitionism. More specifically, it is not committed to the ontological queerness of moral properties existing out there in the fabric of the cosmos. In his book, Carruthers adopts the method of reflective equilibrium as an approach to justifying answers to moral questions about the treatment of animals. Reflective equilibrium is a method of reasoning or a way we can justify moral beliefs. 
In this process, we try to find unity or consistency among our moral principles and those common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true. On this view, moral principles are justified if they are congruent with our common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true and unjustified if they disagree with our common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true. For example, suppose Brian believes in a moral principle that claims that the right action is the one that has the best consequences. How can he justify this moral principle? Under reflective equilibrium, he can justify this moral principle by appealing to particular cases to see if it explains our common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true. He could, for example, appeal to the trolley problem as a way to justify the moral principle that the right action is the one that has the best consequences. Since many people would agree that pulling the switch to kill the one person to save the five people on the trolley problem would be the right action to perform, Brian argues, this provides justification or support to his moral principle under reflective equilibrium. Ryan, an opponent of this moral principle, by contrast, can undermine it by also appealing to particular cases where the moral principle disagrees with our common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true. He could point out, for instance, that the claim that the right action is the one that has the best consequences leads to the absurd conclusion that a doctor is morally obligated to kill his one healthy patient to harvest his organs to save the lives of his five sick patients. Since this moral principle disagrees with a common sense moral belief that we are confident is true, Ryan argues, this provides a reason to reject it. Once Brian is confronted with these cases, he has three options here. He can reject the moral principle, modify it to accommodate this objection, or bite the bullet by continuing to accept the moral principle despite the fact that it disagrees with a common sense moral belief that we are confident is true. How does one determine which choice would be more reasonable? The answer is that it depends. Sometimes we are more confident in our common sense moral beliefs than we are in the moral principle. In other times, we think the moral principle can be adjusted to accommodate the objection without being ad hoc or losing the motivation behind it. Still other times, we will be more confident that the moral principle is true and that our common sense moral beliefs are mistaken. Why must we use the method of reflective equilibrium to arrive at answers to moral questions? The answer is that there does not seem to be any alternatives. This is because there are no moral beliefs that we are completely certain are true. After all, there will always be counterexamples that might undermine them. This problem also applies to other areas of philosophy, such as epistemology. Consider, for instance, the common sense belief that I have hands, and the general principle that I might be dreaming that I have hands. In this situation, I must decide if I am more confident in my common sense belief or the general principle. The way I can justify my general principles would be to appeal to particular cases to see if it is congruent with my common sense beliefs about the external world. In other words, I must use reflective equilibrium by appealing to particular cases to justify general principles in epistemology. Since the method of reflective equilibrium requires that we start from our common sense moral beliefs that we are confident are true, Carruthers must explain what our common sense moral beliefs about animals are prior to us establishing moral principles regarding the appropriate treatment of them. He writes, quote, It will be useful to have a rough idea at the outset of what our common sense morality tell us about the status and appropriate treatment of animals. The general view seems to imply that animals have partial moral standing, their lives and experiences having direct moral significance, but much less than that of human beings. Most people hold that it is wrong to cause animals unnecessary suffering. Opinions will differ as to what counts as necessary. Some will say that the suffering caused by the testing of detergents is permissible. Others would allow suffering only in the course of genuine scientific experiments. Yet others would allow animals to suffer only in the course of important medical experiments. But all will agree that gratuitous suffering, suffering caused for no good reason, is wrong. In his book, Crothers argues that the moral theory of contractualism is the most satisfactory account of right action. First developed by John Rawls in his book, A Theory of Justice, contractualism is the view according to which the right action is the one that is in accordance with moral rules that are created by rational agents. To understand contractualism, it is necessary to consider a thought experiment that Rawls uses to motivate this moral theory. 
Imagine that everyone gathered together to decide what moral rules society should be governed by. Furthermore, suppose that everyone is ignorant of whether they will be rich or poor, black or white, male or female, and so on once these moral rules have been established for society. In other words, they will lack all knowledge about themselves. Once the moral rules are established, everyone will have to live by them. Given that everyone is ignorant of what economic class, race, or gender they will have once the moral rules have been established, they will self-interestedly select moral rules that will treat all groups of people fairly. If I am one of the rational agents responsible for creating the moral rules, for instance, I will not want to establish a moral rule that biases money or power in the favor of white men. This is because I could end up as black or female who will be disadvantaged by having to live by such a moral rule. The opposite is also true. I would not, for the same reason, want to establish a moral rule that biases money or power in the favor of blacks or females. After all, if I turn out to be a white male, I will be worse off by having to live by such a moral rule. If all parties involved agree on moral rules that will treat everybody fairly, then it will not matter much which group I end up being a part of. After all, I will satisfy an acceptable standard of well-being regardless of whether I end up as rich or poor, black or white, male or female. Why? Does Rawls make it the case in his thought experiment that the people selecting the moral rules to govern society are ignorant of facts about themselves? His purpose behind this is to eliminate bias that would otherwise result if people knew what economic class, race, or gender they would have in society. People naturally favor moral rules that benefit themselves even if it is at the expense of others. Rawls acknowledges this aspect of human nature and imagines a thought experiment that eliminates this worry so that we can put forth moral principles in a dispassionate way. Contractualism is the view according to which the right action is the one that is in accordance with moral rules that are created by rational agents. The rational agents are ignorant of facts about themselves such as their economic class, race, or gender in order to ensure that they do not bias the moral rules that will govern society during the decision-making process. Since non-rational agents are unable to participate in the contract process, they will therefore not be protected by any of the moral rules that govern society. Accordingly, we will have no direct moral obligations towards animals, since they lack rationality of the sort necessary to engage in the creation of moral rules. Given that we have no direct moral obligations to animals, we may permissibly use them for human purposes, such as food or experimentation. At this point, Carruthers considers two objections to the claim that animals should not be entitled to direct moral protection under contractualism. One is that, first, if rational agents creating moral rules are to be ignorant of their economic class, race, or gender, why could they not also be ignorant of their species? Surely, if I did not know whether I would end up as an animal or a human once the moral rules had been established, I would want to self-interestedly select moral rules that will entitle animals to direct moral protection. This will guarantee that if I end up as an animal, I will have my interests respected. Carruthers' contractualism, therefore, seems to arbitrarily ignore species as a relevant consideration when it comes to rational agents creating moral rules. Carruthers responds to this objection by pointing out that, under contractualism, the purpose of people being ignorant of their economic class, race, and gender is grounded in the fact that these characteristics are widely believed to be morally irrelevant. While many people agree that your race does not determine if we have direct moral obligations to you, most do think that species membership determines if we have direct moral obligations to something. Many believe, for instance, that we can reject the claim that we have direct moral obligations to cows on the basis of their species membership. Since species membership is not widely believed to be morally irrelevant to the treatment of someone, it is not arbitrary to exclude it as a relevant consideration for rational agents who are involved in the creation of moral rules. Another objection is that it is not obvious why there could not be rational agents to represent the interests of animals in a similar way that a lawyer represents the interests of a pet in a court case involving a disputed will. If animal interests could be represented, then this is another way we can justify direct moral obligations toward animals under contractualism. Crowther claims that the problem with this objection is that it is an unmotivated principle. 
No independent reason is offered in its favor other than the fact that it will achieve the desired result that we have direct moral obligations to animals. Accordingly, there is no basis for extending direct moral obligations to animals under contractualism. Carruthers points out that, even though we have no direct moral obligations toward animals under contractualism, this does not mean we may permissibly be cruel to them. This is because, according to him, we have indirect moral obligations to animals. But what are direct and indirect moral obligations? A direct moral obligation, first, is a moral obligation that is grounded in the interest that the being has. Beings that we have a direct moral obligation to can be wronged by our actions. If we have a direct moral obligation to a being, that means that this being has moral importance for his own sake, independent of his usefulness to others. For example, I have a direct moral obligation not to kill you. This direct moral obligation is not grounded in the fact that others would be hurt if I ended your life or any other possible side effects that your death might cause. Rather, it is grounded in the fact that you have interests that should be protected. You matter morally in your own right, and your life is worthy of protection for this reason. An indirect moral obligation, by contrast, is not grounded in the interest that that thing has. Things that we have an indirect moral obligation to cannot be wronged by our actions. If we have an indirect moral obligation towards something, that means that this thing does not have moral importance for its own sake. For example, I have an indirect moral obligation not to destroy the Mona Lisa. This is not because the painting itself can be wrong by my act of destroying it. Rather, my act of destroying it wrongs the other human beings who own that painting or value it. When it comes to the treatment of animals, Crothers believes that the best explanation for why cruelty towards animals is wrong is grounded in an indirect moral obligation. Animals, on his view, cannot be wronged by an act of cruelty. In his book, Crothers puts forward two different accounts of indirect moral obligations toward animals. The first explanation Crothers offers to explain why cruelty towards animals is wrong is that it would cause offense to animal lovers. For example, suppose I beat a stray dog's head in public with a baseball bat for mere sadistic pleasure. Surely this act would be wrong. But why? Crothers claims that it would be wrong because it would cause offense to animal lovers. If the act of beating a stray dog's and head in public with a baseball bat for mere sadistic pleasure is wrong because it would cause offense to animal lovers, then this can explain the moral wrongness of cruelty towards animals without having to accept the claim that the animal itself can be wronged by our actions. Moreover, we can in many cases ground the moral wrongness of an action by appeal to the offense that it would cause. For example, suppose you came across a bigot shouting racial epithets in public. This is clearly wrong given that it will be offensive to minorities. Basing the moral wrongness of animal cruelty on the offense it would cause to animal lovers, therefore, seems plausible at face value. However, Crothers believes that this offense to animal lovers account of indirect moral obligations is implausible. The reason is that, while it can explain why cruelty towards animals is wrong when it is performed in public, it cannot explain why it would be wrong if it were done in private. Suppose and said that I beat a stray dog's head in the privacy of my own home, where nobody would ever find out. Would my act of sadistic cruelty now be morally permissible, since it will no longer cause offense to animal lovers? Someone might object that private animal cruelty will still run the risk of upsetting animal lovers, since the dog's cries might be heard by my neighbors. However, this reply is unsatisfactory, since we can imagine a situation in which such worries no longer apply. To demonstrate this, Crothers makes us consider the following thought experiment. Astrid has left Earth on a space rocket on an irreversible trajectory that will take her out of the solar system and forever out of contact with her fellow human beings. Now in her rocket, she carries with her a cat. As the years pass, she becomes bored and ties the cat to the wall and uses it as a dartboard. Clearly, we still believe that Astrid acted wrongly, despite the fact that no animal lovers could possibly be offended by her cruelty towards the cat. This suggests that the offense to animal lovers' account of indirect moral obligations to animals is inadequate. 
Carruthers argues that we can explain the moral wrongs of animal cruelty without having to accept the claim that we have direct moral obligations toward them. This is because we have indirect moral obligations toward animals. However, as we have seen, we cannot account for the moral wrongs of animal cruelty by appealing to the claim that it would cause offense to animal lovers. If this is right, then what alternative indirect moral obligation views are available? At this point, Carruthers argues instead that cruelty towards animals is wrong because it displays a cruel character. To motivate the moral principle that it is plausible to judge actions based on the cruel character that it displays, Crothers asks us to consider the following thought experiment. Lazy Jane. Jane is a physician attending a medical conference and is currently sitting at the bar enjoying a drink. A man walks in the bar and starts to have a heart attack. Jane observes this man's predicament but continues to enjoy her drink despite the man suffering and risk of death. Clearly, Jane acted wrongly. But why? It is not plausible to claim that she violated his right to health care. For even if there is such a right, how could we claim that he had a right to health care from her specifically? Nor can we claim that Jane's act led to bad consequences. Given that the heart attack occurred in a bar at a medical conference, there were other physicians willing to provide the man medical assistance. The best explanation of the wrongness of Jane's refusal to help the heart attack victim is grounded in the claim that her inaction displays a cruel character because she showed a lack of beneficence. It should be kept in mind, however, that a failure to show beneficence need not always display a cruel character since we must take a rational agent's motives and circumstances into consideration. Modifying our example of Lazy Jane, suppose we are informed that the reason she did not help the heart attack victim is that she had a migraine or a twisted ankle. If the story is told in this way, then it no longer seems that Jane displayed a cruel character when she fails to help the heart attack victim. The reason is that having a migraine or a twisted ankle would make helping the heart attack victim extremely burdensome. This is all still assuming, of course, that there are other physicians in the room with Jane that are able to help the heart attack victim. If she were the only physician in the room, then she would be morally obligated to help because she would be the heart attack victim's only chance for survival. But if it is plausible to judge actions based on the cruel character that it displays, then we can apply this count as the best explanation for the moral wrongness of animal cruelty. On this view, animal cruelty is wrong not because it causes harm to the animal, but because it displays a cruel character. The advantage of this account is that it explains why Ash's cruelty to her cat is morally wrong, despite the fact that no animal lovers could possibly be offended by her actions. After all, her act of animal cruelty is still displaying a cruel character. But why is displaying a cruel character morally wrong? According to Carruthers, displaying a cruel character is wrong because it will likely lead to cruelty towards other rational agents. Thus, although Asher's act of animal cruelty will not actually lead her to be cruel towards other rational agents, it might have. Since her act of animal cruelty might have led her to be cruel towards other rational agents, this would be the grounds for condemning her actions as wrong. Consequently, Carruthers' contractualism is congruent with our common sense moral beliefs regarding animal cruelty while at the same time non-arbitrarily rejecting the claim that we have direct moral obligations toward animals. But how far does Carruthers' character account of indirect moral obligations go? What uses of animals will count as displaying a cruel character? Crothers answers that it will depend on the motives and circumstances. When we consider people who run factory farm operations or experiment on animals, the motives of these people are certainly not trivial since they are trying to earn a living. The person who slits the throats of pigs in a slaughterhouse and someone that tortures animals for sadistic pleasure clearly have different motives. The former is concerned with providing for himself or his family, whereas the latter is merely satisfying trivial pleasure. Given that the motives of the people involved in factory farming operations and animal experimentation are grounded in earning a living, their actions cannot plausibly be regarded as displaying a cruel character. Accordingly, the practices of factory farming and animal ex experimentation are morally permissible. What role do qualities of character play in Carruthers' contractualist moral theory? After all, contractualism seems strictly concerned with moral obligations of non-interference, such as the prohibition against killing or assault,
but not matters of beneficence like helping the poor or the elderly. How does Carruthers justify the moral significance of beneficent qualities of character on his account? Carruthers maintains that rational agents choosing more rules to govern their society would surely create more rules that obligate others to develop beneficent qualities of character. After all, a society in which no one showed beneficence to others would be callous. Consider, for instance, a child drowning in a shallow pond. Is a stranger walking by morally obligated to save this drowning child when doing so would require only minimal effort? Surely, he does have such a moral obligation. But how can we explain this judgment if there are no moral obligations of beneficence? This case suggests that there are moral obligations of beneficence. However, what grounds this judgment? It does not seem plausible to claim that the moral obligation of beneficence is grounded in moral rights. This is because it would prove too much. Suppose, for example, that I need money to purchase food in order to avoid starvation. If I have a right to beneficent treatment of others, particularly a right to financial assistance, then everybody would be morally obligated to provide me money to purchase food. This is because moral rights generally impose moral obligations on others to respect that right. Take, for example, your right not to be killed. Everybody, not simply a few select people, is morally obligated to respect that right or to follow it. The best explanation for moral obligation to help others, therefore, is grounded in the claim that doing so displays beneficence. What this means in practice is that rational agents should try to cultivate empathy or concern about the suffering of their fellow human beings. If rational agents act in this way, this will guarantee that others will generally get the help they need. However, if rational agents cultivate empathy for the suffering of others, then this will naturally lead to concern for the suffering of animals as a byproduct of this general attitude toward human suffering. However, the concern for animal suffering, as we have seen, will be an indirect one given that they are not rational agents. Contractualism is the view according to which the right action is the one that is in accordance with moral rules that are created by rational agents. The rational agents are ignorant of facts about themselves such as their economic class, race, or gender in order to ensure that they do not bias the moral rules that will govern society during the decision-making process. Since non-rational agents are unable to participate in the contract process, they will therefore not be protected by any of the moral rules that govern society. Accordingly, we will have no direct moral obligations toward animals since they lack rationality of the sort necessary to engage in the creation of moral rules. However, this does not mean we may permissibly be cruel to animals. This is because we have indirect moral obligations to them. On this indirect moral obligation view, cruelty towards animals is wrong because it makes one display a cruel character. Displaying a cruel character, in turn, is wrong because it is likely to lead to cruelty towards other rational agents. Now that I have explained Carruthers' arguments for the claim that we have no direct moral obligations toward animals, I want to point out two advantages or reasons for why it is plausible. The first advantage of contractualism is that it has a plausible solution to the problem of distributive justice. Distributive justice is the issue of how we morally ought to share limited resources of money and power with others. Remember that, under contractualism, rational agents are ignorant of what position they will occupy in society once the moral rules have been established. In other words, they do not know whether they will be rich or poor. Accordingly, rational agents will self-interestedly choose moral rules that will treat both economic classes fairly. Regardless if they end up as rich or poor, they will satisfy an acceptable standard of well-being. Rawls calls this solution to the problem of distributive justice the difference principle. Quote, differences in wealth and power are only acceptable if those who are worse off under the system are better off than the worse off people would have been under any alternative system. Since contractualism can justify egalitarian beliefs many people have about the poor and disadvantaged, this makes Carruthers' moral theory attractive. Another advantage to Carruthers' arguments is that he has a plausible explanation of the source of morality. Under contractualism, 
Morality comes from rational agents and does not exist out there in the fabric of the cosmos similar to mass and energy. Contractionism, therefore, does not suffer from the difficulties of intuitionism since it is not committed to a bizarre or a queer ontology concerning the source of morality. Contractionism is the view according to which the right action is the one that is in accordance with moral rules that are created by rational agents. The rational agents are ignorant of facts about themselves such as their economic class, race, or gender in order to ensure that they do not bias the moral rules that will govern society during the decision-making process. Since non-rational agents are unable to participate in the contract process, they will therefore not be protected by any of the moral rules that govern society. Accordingly, we will have no direct moral obligation toward animals since they lack rationality of the sort necessary to engage in the creation of moral rules. One objection to this account of our moral obligations toward animals is that it fails to explain why we have direct moral obligations to non-rational humans, such as infants and the mentally disabled. If we only have direct moral obligations towards rational agents that can engage in the creation of moral rules, and human infants and the mentally disabled are incapable of participating in this activity, how can we avoid the conclusion that we have no direct moral obligations to them? May we, therefore, slaughter them for food or use them in extremely painful experiments? Surely this would be morally outrageous. If Carrera's argument entails that we may permissibly treat non-rational humans in this way, then we should reject his arguments on grounds of absurdity. This objection is known as the problem of marginal cases. It is a challenge for defenders of animal use to explain how their moral theory can account for our direct moral obligation toward non-rational humans without accepting that we have direct moral obligations to animals. Carruthers is unconvinced that his contractualist account entails that we may permissibly treat non-rational humans in this way. On the contrary, he thinks that he can establish that we have direct moral obligations to non-rational humans on slippery slope and social stability considerations. The slippery slope replies as follows. Carruthers' observation is that it is not obvious who counts as a rational agent and who does not. How does one determine, for example, if a human being with low intelligence counts as a rational agent or not? In other words, there is difficulty in drawing a line between human beings that are rational and those who are not. Since human beings are imperfect judges of who counts as rational and who does not, we should err on the side of caution by granting that we have direct moral obligations to all human beings. Otherwise, some rational agents will be mistreated because they are mistakenly believed by others to be non-rational. This response makes sense. After all, rational agents creating moral rules will surely want to adjust the ones they create so that they will not be abused once enacted. One of those moral rules might be to grant that we have direct moral obligations toward all human beings so that there is no chance or risk that we might misidentify a human being as non-rational and unjustly mistreat him. Since many people view animals as distinct from themselves, by contrast, there is not the same practical risk involved in the possible mistreatment of humans if we deny that we have direct moral obligations to animals. In other words, denying that we have direct moral obligations to animals will not lead to abuse of other humans. Carruthers' final response to the problem of marginal cases is based on the question of social stability. He suggests that, under contractualism, Moral rules must be psychologically supportable. In other words, moral rules must produce social stability and not be viewed as outrageous by rational agents. One example of such a moral rule would be that a rational agent's family members should have direct moral protection from harm regardless of their intelligence or level of rationality. A moral rule that denied direct moral protection to a rational agent's non-rational family members would produce social instability and would be psychologically impossible to live by. Rational agents creating moral rules, therefore, will not select ones that fail to give direct moral protection to a rational agent's non-rational family members due to the social instability enacting such a moral rule would have for society. Since most rational agents do not have as strong of feelings about animals as they do with their own non-rational family members, rational agents creating moral rules will not have to worry about creating social instability if they establish moral rules which claim that we have no direct moral obligations to animals. Consequently, 
Crothers can account for our direct moral obligations to non-rational humans on grounds of slippery slope and social stability considerations, while at the same time denying the claim that we have direct moral obligations to animals. That concludes my explanation of Peter Carruthers' contractualist case for the moral permissibility of animal use.